Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Luke, CEO of SOCAP, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today. Thank you for joining from wherever you may be and for spending the next hour with us. I just want to say a big thank you um, as well to all of our panelists, whom will be introduced shortly uh, for sharing their time and expertise with us today. A big thank you as well to World Education Services for generously sponsoring this conversation and making all of this possible. Uh, there will be time for some Q&A at the end, so please drop your questions in the chat or in the Q&A feature as you have them, and we'll get to them towards the end of the hour. Uh, so without much further ado, I want to hand it over to Smitha Das, who is an impact investor at World Education Services and our moderator today. Thank you so much, Luke, and thank you to you and SOCAP for hosting this session and creating this space to explore investing in employee ownership models to build generational wealth for immigrants and BIPOC communities. I'm Smitha Das, I lead impact investing at World Education Services or WES. We are a social enterprise that's been around for about 50 years doing credential evaluation services for international students and immigrants coming to the US and Canada. And in 2019, we spun off a philanthropic arm to advance our mission through philanthropy and through impact investing. And so I'm excited to share um, the stories of a few of our investee partners. Todd at Apis and Heritage is joining us as well as Allison. We just approved an investment last week into Project Equities Employee Ownership Catalyst Fund, and also a co-investor, uh, Thaddeus, who is at Living Cities. So hopefully this will be a good conversation to kick off um, a, a good year of SOCAP, including an in-person session um, in, in, uh, in convening in the fall. But we're really excited to bring this community together to talk about employee ownership models, the nuances between the different structures that Allison will talk us through, as well as how we can use these structures to both build wealth, but also build power through democratic governance structures. And so at West, this is really key to how we think about impact. We're thinking about reimagining the building blocks of wealth. And as we think about historically how communities have been able to generate wealth, it's been typically two levers, one, owning your own home, and two, owning your own business. So today we'll dig deeper into owning your own business and how we can democratize access to that as a way to general, uh, generate generational wealth. So I guess with that, um, just to give a flow of what is to come, we'll start off with inviting Allison to share a little bit of an overview of employee ownership getting into some of the language, the nuances between the structures. Um, there's a bit of alphabet soup when it comes to employee ownership. So we'll try to um, deconstruct all of that. And then we'll go into some examples through what Todd and Allison are doing on the ground, as well as invite Thaddeus to share the investor perspective, as well as from Wes's perspective, how we think we can be deploying catalytic capital, impact capital in a pretty flexible blended way to advance these models. And finally, we'll of course turn it to you all for, for some Q&A and thanks to the SOCAP team for monitoring the chat for us. So I suppose with that, I'll, I'll just uh, stop there and, and share, um, let Allison take, take the wheel and, and share more about employee ownership and, and help us get uh, some grounding there. Okay, hey, wonderful. Thank you. And if we could pull up some slides. Um, thank you to SOCAP. Thank you, um, Smitha, and to World Education Services to, uh, for hosting this conversation today. Um, my name is Allison Lingen, and I'm the co-founder of Project Equity. We're a national nonprofit organization with really a single goal, which is to expand employee ownership, uh, really to benefit um, employees and to create this kind of, of wealth building opportunity uh, that we're talking about today. So. Um, if you could flip through actually the next slide and then the following. Great. So, um, so what do we mean when we say employee ownership? Well, it's, it's a proven, but frankly, little known or little understood business structure in which a broad base of employees owns the business where they work. So when, when we're in this conversation today, when we're talking about employee ownership, we mean a structure that gives all employees who meet basic criteria 
you know, maybe they've been with a company for a certain period of time um, or, you know, work, work a 30 hour schedule or a 20 hour schedule or something like that. Um, the opportunity to become owners of that business. So what we're not talking about is, you know, stock options or stock grants, which are typically available only to management or management or key employee buyouts. These can be great. They're just, they're just different in some key ways. Um, and next slide here, and, and as Todd likes to say, and I'm co-signing on, um, employee ownership is a burgeoning asset class. And so the goal of our conversation today is really to help investors understand more about what this asset class looks like, the impacts it creates, why it is especially relevant now, and the range of investment opportunities. So next slide, um, just at a summary high level, the benefits of employee ownership could feel way more than this slide. It is one of those things that when people really get their heads around it, they start nodding and they say, oh yeah, this just makes sense. So it seems like it's positive from all perspectives, from all angles. So employee ownership creates stronger businesses, um, creates high quality jobs for employees with better pay and benefits, um, having a voice in key decisions, Owning the assets of the business and owning assets is, of course, um, the, the only way to build generational wealth. As for the local community and economy, it retains locally owned businesses, retaining that, um, you know, all important local spending and local spending multiplier keeps wealth in that community versus having absentee or corporate ownership or those benefits of ownership accrue to people who don't live there. And it also reduces wealth concentration. So next slide. Why, why now? Why is employee ownership so relevant now? And I feel like I've been saying this for years and the reality is that it just keeps getting more and more relevant. Uh, next slide. So um, the, the great uh, wave of baby boomer retirements known uh, dubbed the silver tsunami is real. Uh, nearly 3 million businesses with employees are at risk as the baby boomers continue to march towards retirement. This represents an estimated one out of every two um, locally owned businesses with employees. So these businesses need buyers. However, if we go to the next slide, we know that selling a business is not easy. So according to a leading national business broker platform, only 20% of businesses put up for sale ever sell. Right? So we have this big um, you know, supply and maybe not enough demand for purchasing the businesses. Employee ownership can, can address that. Um, it's especially challenging for business owners given that their kids are not taking over the family business anymore. So, um, you know, these are, are real issues that, that employee ownership can help address. And then if we go to the next slide, um, you know, add to that, uh, and this is really from a mission perspective where the conversation is focused on today, um, the challenge from, from a worker perspective, right? We know the storyline, people who during the pandemic, we started calling essential workers when actually they've always been essential workers. Um, live teetering right on the edge. So I won't read the stats on this slide, but we know that income equality in the United States is shocking. Uh, but the, the, the fact is that wealth inequality is even more shocking. And this is the gap that undergirds it all, um, that really holds people back. It is so hard to overcome if you're in a low wage job. And that with just a little bit of improvement can make a tremendous difference in people's lives. Now, looking at this through the racial lens, um, it's the, the challenge is just even greater altogether. So racial income and wealth inequality, frankly, underpins the core of what is broken and presents our biggest need. On the next slide, um, employee ownership is proven to address uh, the income gap and help build intergenerational wealth for workers of color. I'm gonna share a couple of stories from companies that Project Equity has helped to transition to employee ownership to, to kind of share what we really mean about this. So the next slide, we've got um, a slice of New York. Uh, they're based in Silicon Valley. They're two pizza shops with over 30 workers. If you could click the down arrow. Um, they've distributed over half a million dollars in profit to its workers over two years. Um, and by the way, they also did great during the pandemic because they came together and quickly and multiple times revamped how they did business to meet the ever changing landscape for restaurants. Um, so, so this half a million dollars in profit was right before the pandemic hit. So you can imagine the value of having that extra cushion um, during that time period. And on the next slide, we've got um, Sarah Vegas. Again, if you could kind of click through the animation here. 
um, Sarah Vegas of, of Niles Pie. So she was one of the founding uh, worker owners at this bakery. And she shared, she tells this great story of um, her first profit sharing check, which was over $9,000. She talks about this being the biggest check that she has ever received. Now, she's worked for food service for her whole career, which is a notoriously challenging sector, whether because of the low wages or the lack of schedule, um, uh, 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 the schedule variability, um, job stability. You know, she showed up at multiple times actually at her employer with a sign on the door that says, we're out of business, you lost your job, sorry. Um, so, so for her, she also happens to be a single mom. Um, you know, she sat down with her, her son, who was 11 at the time, and talked to him about the impact that this, this big check uh, was, was having on their family um, and, you know, invited him to have a conversation with her about what they should do with it. Um, so, you know, big, big effects both financially and, and otherwise, um, but this would have been a 30% increase over, over a $15 minimum wage, um, just to put, put that into perspective. So the, the, the point is that the conversation is not about whether employee ownership delivers impact. Instead, we're really focused on how we get more of it so that its deep impact can be spread further. And in our conversation today, the focus is on the role that investors and capital can play in creating that impact that we know employee ownership really delivers on. Okay, so briefly, I'm gonna go through um, just a little bit about what employee ownership transitions are about. If we go to the next slide and then one more. Um, so, so employee owners, so this is a broad base of employees where basically everyone who works there has the opportunity to be an owner. And when we transition the business, we're talking about taking a successful, profitable legacy business and selling all or sometimes part of the business into a vehicle that is owned broadly by those employees, typically through a stock or asset sale. Um, so the purchase of the business is, again, I'm gonna use the word typically a lot <laughs> because there's lots of variations as well, but typically debt finance, you can do equity um, in some cases. Uh, and that debt is assumed by the business, not by the employees. So the employees aren't taking out loans or asking their rich uncle, you know, a lot of them don't have rich uncles, right? Money out of the mattress isn't involved here. Um, the business is taking out the loan and paying back um, uh, the, out of the operational cash flow over a period of time. So the now employee owned business is typically led and managed similarly to how it was prior to the sale. So that in, in, ensures some stability moving forward. Um, so we still have a, a CEO or general manager. We still have a management team, right? Um, and what is new is often the structure for governance of the business. So there, there can be a, a layer of governance put in place um, that has employee representation on it. So depending on the employee ownership vehicle, members of the board will be elected from the employees or they may represent employee interests. And then on the next slide here to that alphabet soup that Smitha was talking about, um, uh, this is just a summary of the three most common forms of employee ownership structures in the United States. There are others as well, but um, from left to right here, we've got employee stock ownership plans or ESOPs, which um, is the one that people are most familiar with. It's the largest in number, <clears throat> excuse me, ESOPs are a trust vehicle. Um, and it provides ownership through company shares held as a retirement asset. Uh, and, these, and that grows over time. They're highly tax advantaged because the federal government wants more employee ownership. Um, but that tax advantage requires compliance with tax and retirement laws. There's of course a cost to that compliance. So it's really only a fit for companies with roughly 40 employees or more. <clears throat> the other two forms work for, for any size, smaller all the way up to very, very large. Um, and worker co-ops themselves include represent, representative governance in the form of a board primarily composed of employee owners elected by the full base of employee owners and it provides wealth building through annual profit sharing payments. And then the third one on the right here, uh, the EOT stands for Employee Ownership Trust, it has a little bit of both. It's a, also a trust vehicle. Um, the board includes the trustee of the EOT and may include employee representatives as well. And the EOT provides wealth building also through annual profit sharing. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Smitha to kick off our conversation. 
Thank you, Allison, for, for walking us through some of that language as well as the different types of employee ownership structures. I think it would be helpful to just get into some specifics. So I might pass to Todd and have you share a little bit more about your model at APIS and Heritage, particularly how you're embedding a racial equity lens into the employee ownership structure. Excellent. Thank you so much, Smitha, and thank you to, to the SOCAP team for creating this opportunity for us. Um, and, and good morning, good afternoon. I know SOCAP has a global audience, so good evening, good night, and good tomorrow to, to the folks who, who may be watching right now. Um, as Smitha was saying, my name is Todd LeBrett. I'm co-principal of Apis and Heritage Capital Partners. Um, and we're, you know, I'm excited to share with you uh, the way that we look at employee ownership as, a, as an opportunity for impact for workers and communities, as well as for investment. Um, and, and the main tool that we use, we are a sponsor of, of Legacy Fund One, which is what we see as our kind of reimagining of capitalism and entrepreneurship that really pulls together the longstanding tools of broad-based employee ownership, as Allison was just describing, specifically um, the models of the ESOP and the co-op together, um, and directing it, as Smith was referring to, to the communities where we know there's the greatest opportunity for wealth building and the greatest need for wealth building, which are our communities of color, BIPOC communities. Uh, so, so essentially, you know, what we do is we're essentially a mezzanine debt fund, and we live really at that, that intersection of best-in-class uh, private credit, private equity, and, and the world of ESOPs and co-ops. Um, and, and basically what we do is we uh, buy great, small, closely held businesses, and we convert them into great, you know, small or medium-sized employee-owned firms that, that do you know, a, a variety of things. One, that outperform their peers and, and uh, Allison Gray gave some great numbers and statistics. I'm gonna give a few more um, shortly on, on how employee-owned businesses, when done the right way, um, um, can outperform their peers. Um, that also distribute the fruits of that outperformance to their workforce. So all of that, all of that outperformance isn't just being captured by a, a single person or a small family, but are actually, it's, it's distributed broadly amongst the workforce. Um, and, and three, does some really good things for communities and states and cities um, in, in terms of anchoring jobs, um, anchoring companies in place, and, and um, really getting away from some of, the, some of the, the, the worst practices that we've seen in the world of investments in private equity, which is stripping companies out, pulling out cash flows, moving companies outside the communities that, that help build them and support them. As we always say, you know, an employee owner is not going to fire themselves so that they can move their company, you know, move their company overseas or move their company out of state. So a lot of benefits all, all the way around. Um, Allison stated before, 50 years of stagnant real wages for working Americans. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, 40 years of decreasing wealth for the bottom 50%. Um, and as we always say, you know, uh, a common term in the Black community, when, when America gets the cold, uh, Black America gets the flu and Brown America gets the flu. Um, and this is, that's a saying pre-COVID. So I'm sure we could change it and say Black and Brown America get, get something a lot more serious than the flu when there are wealth issues in this country. Um, and the reason why we love the, the ESOP model um, as our legal structure and as our tax structure is that there's there's 50 years of, of uh, legislative history and tax history on ESOPs as a, as a model. Um, um, it's actually the, the lesser known cousin of the 401k and functions very similarly to a 401k that invests just in the, in the shares of the company um, that's connected to the ESOP. Um, almost 7,000 ESOPs in the US, and a lot of folks don't know this, but a 100% employee-owned company um, in an S corporation structure pays $0 in federal corporate taxes, and in 44 out of 50 states pays $0 in state corporate tax, or, or it's deferred, similar to the way that, that uh, the tax benefit can be deferred in a 401k. And this, this is this kind of, kind of uh, a tax benefit that's also uh, can also happen in co-ops as well, sub -cha -cha chapter T of co-ops. There's a similar tax benefit that really creates an interesting investment opportunity into these models as well, because you will have companies that all things uh, equal, uh, employee-owned companies will have better cash flows purely from a tax standpoint, but then from an actual operational standpoint, the alignment of interest between the workers who are now also owners who are now, if done the right way, are thinking about like owners, thinking how their day-to-day -day job and operations can contribute to the bottom line of the company, to the success and the long-term viability of the company. Um, all these things create that, you know, eight to 11% faster revenue growth, um, eight and a half percent profitability increase, and up to 75% productivity gains, and significantly less turnover of workforces, which as we know today is, is key 
to keeping a business alive and successful. All these things that you see employee-owned companies and the research shows um, um, create a great investment opportunity. From the impact side, and I'll, I'll close out quickly, from the impact side, um, some really good research um, done by the National Center for Employee Ownership, um, as well as Rutgers um, and, and several other organizations out there show that the benefits to these specifically for workers of color um, is, is really powerful. So when looking at workers of color age 28 to 34, the median household net worth of an, a, a, a BIPOC person of color compared to their peer in a non-employee owned uh, firm is 79% higher for the employee owners. Their medium income is 30% higher for employee owners. Median job tenure is 36% higher and employee owners are almost three times as likely to receive other kind of ancillary benefits like tuition benefits from their employer and their employers as their non-employee um, non owned um, um, peers. So again, from a, from a business side and from an, uh, a worker side, outcome in the community side, you know, the, the case for employee ownership, we think is really clear. And as, as all of us on this call are doing, we're out here as we say, evangelizing the model, uh, these models as, as something that needs to be more pervasive um, in this country to help address some of these issues. Um, so I won't go into a ton of details, just, just briefly, again, kind of like how we invest. We invest um, in, in what we consider essential, um, essential service industries in the lower middle market. So we're looking for companies that are between, call it one and, and uh, $6 million in EBITDA that are in industries such as uh, landscaping, commercial cleaning, uh, mechanical contracting. So your, electric, your electricians, your roofers, your plumbers, um, uh, elder care and home care, food processing, child care, waste hauling, um, industries where, where really your workforce is, is um, their interaction with the customer and their kind of frontline nature of this workforce, making them employee owners, getting them on board with the mission of the company is going to have huge impacts for, for quality of, of service provision uh, for your customers and can make a big difference. Um, we're also looking, we're only also looking at companies that have um, at least 40 workers, kind of referencing back to what Allison was saying about size of companies that work best with the ESOP model. And we also only will invest in companies that have at least one third of their workforce being BIPOC workers. And across our portfolio, at least 40% of the workforce um, needs to be BIPOC, um, BIPOC workers. Uh, I will say this, we're, we're kind of coming up on the, the edge of our, our first two uh, transaction closes right now. And uh, we're looking at about 200 workers across the two companies and with at least a, about 75 to 80% of those workers being BIPOC. So while we set the floors at 33 and 40%, what we're finding when you look at these industries in certain areas of the country is that you can get significant, um, significantly more uh, impact um, and, and impact significantly more workers of color. And our goal across our portfolio is to have the average worker in our portfolio be able to retire at the end of their career with somewhere between 70 and $120,000 just in their ESOP account. Um, and statistically across the US, the average employee owner uh, uh, has about $140,000 in their ESOP account, plus another $90,000 in a, in a diversified account, such as a 401k. So I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers and a lot of statistics at, at you all. I want to give you guys a, a taste um, of, of us uh, and, and kind of what our focus is. And, and we can get into some of the details of how, how our investment product works if that comes up in the Q&A. But really excited to be here and, and uh, uh, be on this panel and share with you guys what we're doing. So I will then... I will now breathe and I will, I will pass it back to Samantha. No, thank you so much for, for first of all, just um, echoing Allison's argument for employee ownership. I think where um, Thaddeus and I kind of come in as investors, is it's the business case, the impact case around employee ownership is established. These are not new models. They've been around for a long time. So the question is kind of why haven't they taken hold? What is the role of investment capital to demonstrate some of these newer models, newer ways to invest in employee ownership transitions, and also scale them over time? And so I think that would be a really interesting conversation. But I, I, before we go to the investor perspective, I, I want to give Allison a chance. I saw a question in the chat around new businesses and the way you can perhaps use some of these models to set up an ownership structure. And um, Todd mentioned ESOPs are typically for larger companies around 40 employees and above, but some of the other models that you were mentioning, co-ops and employee ownership trusts, perpetual purpose trusts could be used for smaller organizations. And I know at Project Equity, you're pretty agnostic to working across these different 
structure. So I'm curious, kind of, could you share a little bit of the nuance of when you use different types of ownership structures for which types of businesses? And if you want to weave in an example. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I Todd, I just love hearing you talk about employee ownership, and I would love to see every everyone's faces because I would imagine, you know, everyone was nodding vigor vigorously <laughs> um, as you were talking, and and that's that's kind of our goal here. So we're trying to get you nodding vigorously about employee ownership so that you're excited to learn more about how to have an impact to to make more of it. So, um, so yeah, when we when we look when we're talking with a, a company and and kind of looking at what employee ownership form might be the best fit for them, one of the first passes we do is size, you know, if you're not 40 or more employees, then then we got two options for you. Otherwise, we got three options for you. Three, there's other forms as well. So more than three sometimes. But um, so that size threshold is important. If you're, you know, let's say you're a 50 or 100 employee company, you could be a co-op, you could be an EOT, you could be an ESOP. Um, then the next question really becomes, you know, it, it's all about the goal, right? So if we're talking about uh, we can do we can do independent transitions. We can do more acquisitions where it's less about the goal, right? It's about buying the company and then turning it into employee ownership. But if we're talking about an independent transition, where the company remains independent um, and we're supporting capital, to, and then it becomes an independent um, employee-owned business after the the transaction happens. Um, it really is about the goal, you know, the goal from the perspective of the business owner and from the perspective of the employees. So one of the things that comes up um, with ESOPs for some business owners is um, uh, that it, 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 it's not sort of perpetual in nature. So the Employee Ownership Trust uses the perpetual purpose trust as the structure. Um, and so for some business owners, really, they want their business to be a wealth generating engine, you know, into the next hundred years. Um, and they don't want to sort of risk the potential of an ESOP being acquired. Um, uh, by, by another company and having that employee ownership component be dissolved. There are ways to address that. You know, we could get into that maybe in another, another webinar. Um, so that's one of the considerations. And then, um, you know, the, the worker co-op, as I noted, has, a, has a, a governing board by the employee owners built right into the structure. So an off-the-shelf ES ESOP doesn't require it. But, you know, what Apis and Heritage is doing is they're combining the two. So, you, yes, you have that governance structure. You can build a governance structure into either the ESOP or the EOT. But the worker co-op, you know, it's, it's, it's already built into the structure. That's so, so for, for, for companies that, that really feel that, that they want that to be a priority, they're often really drawn to the worker co-op model in order to accomplish it. So it's, it's not about, um, you know, it's, it's not about like one is better than the other. Um, and it's also not necessarily, I have to pick only one, right? You pick elements of the, of the different structures and you can combine them um, to, to make the, the employee ownership that's going to be the right fit for that group of people and, and that particular transaction. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that not all employee ownership models necessarily build power through democratic governance that in some models like the ESOP model, it is a choice. And so that was definitely something we learned in our diligence with Apis and Heritage Capital Partners, their intense, um, their intentionality around it, their partnership with Democracy at Work Institute and how they bring in the principles of the cooperative model into ESOPs. I think, Todd, your experience in the worker ownership space speaks to that. Um, and I know that's something that resonated uh, with ADS too, but so maybe I might pass to you and just um, have you share why you invested in project equity and, and what brings you to shared ownership models writ large. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in and give you kind of um, our lens as to why, why we are, ended up as, a, as an investor in Project Equity. And uh, first, uh, I'd also like to thank you guys for having me on the uh, on the panel. I'm super excited about this. Uh, um, to, to, I should probably start like how we got into in fact investing. Uh, we have two, um, two basically has two um, like a family of investment funds. Uh, fund one we opened in about two thousand eight um, that looked originally to focus on sort of uh, affordable housing, scaling CDFIs and, and social impact bonds through pay for success. Um, then we opened up our, our second fund in two thousand and fifteen uh, to kind of carry forward that mission. Um, but in two thousand eighteen, Living Cities uh, went through a firm wide pivot to focus on racial equity and inclusion. Uh, so that meant sort of changing the investment thesis of the fund, pivoting it to REI as a means of cutting that lens across our entire business model. Um, that led us to the tail end of our commitment period for fund two. We were looking to 
uh, as well as provide some financial support for diverse fund managers who have the spirit of access to capital market. Uh, we wanted to look at various vehicles of wealth creation for BIPOC persons and communities. Uh, with, with the idea that not everybody would invest in like a private equity or VC fund, but there are certain, there are a couple of different vehicles that, that are more tangible to end users uh, and, uh, and a broader uh, base in end users. Um, so what kind of drove us to private uh, project equity, and this is probably going to be a lot more uh, what uh, Allison and, and Todd have both hit on, um, their, their focus on the majority and uh, majority low to moderate income workers and the prioritization of companies that have a majority BIPOC workforce uh, that really aligned with our, our commitment to serving communities of color. Um, we had a wealth creation thesis around that. Uh, the, the center around uh, home ownership and owning where you where you work uh, where you live as a means of real, creating wealth and project equity we kind of found uh, the, the number of different channels um, but it also offered an opportunity for for people to own where they worked and that was a massive amount that was a massive like point of generating wealth that we weren't thinking about when we did our thesis shift so we were kind of very happy to run into the Alice and Steve at project equity um, our biggest sort of what what stood out in the diligence and 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 continues to stand out as as having been in this deal with the project equity for a bit now, um, we definitely believe that small businesses are the backbones of local communities. And to uh, uh, Ellison's point earlier about the, uh, the the demographic aging of baby boomers without succession plans, uh, what happens when a business owner isn't turning the keys over and the reins over to the to the children? Um, normally. Uh, what happens is you know, they, a larger government from another area comes and buys this company and, uh, and they take all the, the, the wealth creation out of the community. Uh, we view employee ownership as a complete natural panacea to this uh, and, and to, to keep wealth in the community and um, also to, to generate um, individual wealth with an REI focus. Thanks for that. Um, I think it's interesting you were touching on the different types of capital that you're looking to to deploy. Allison, you mentioned this too. There's kind of a range you can invest um, in funds that are doing employee ownership transitions um, or building this space uh, through debt, through equity. I see a question in the chat around the role of grant capital. So I'm, I'm curious, like maybe we'll start with getting into the specifics because you both have funds, Allison and Todd, that look very different as investors in both. Um, and so it just kind of tests us at West to be really flexible with the types of capital we deploy into funds that are doing employee ownership. I'll mention for direct investments in employee ownership, there's also a variety of ways you can invest. For example, just with worker cooperatives, you can invest in through debt, but you could also invest through non-voting preferred stock and other kind of quasi-equity structures. And so um, I feel like through my journey through employee ownership, I've been learning about more and more ways to invest in a more non-dilutive way. And so I'm curious if you could also share um, the, the reasons why you structured your funds the way you did, as well as uh, kind of where you see the role and um, to the question in the chat for grant capital, because that's something we also um, are certainly looking to blend into our approach. I can, I can go ahead and, and kick us off with that. Um, as, as far as kind of how and why we structured our, our product the way we did, you know, the question of the, the employees own the firm, but you're trying to get in outside capital. How does that work? And Smith, I think you did a great job at kind of kind of summarizing kind of high level how that works. Um, how we invest in companies is, is we use a, a, a mezzanine a mezzanine instrument that has, a, of course, debt like features to it, but also um, enables us to, to get warrants in the firm. So we are able to 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 take advantage of equity upside, specific, specifically equity upside that that we were able to help facilitate by investing uh, in the firm. So um, our warrants actually run kind of side by side with, with the, the, the equity that the, the owners hold in the trust or the worker owners hold in the trust. So if the, the worker owners have not built any wealth in the trust because the performance of the company um, hasn't, you know, the, the, the company hasn't grown, then our warrants are also worthless as well. Whereas if we help grow the company while we're there, our warrants will grow. So, so we believe, and I think one thing that employee ownership really, really speaks to. When I when I was uh, um, 
uh, when I was in, in grad school, they always talked about the, the costs that are associated with having misaligned interests in organizations. So the, the investors want one thing, the, the executives want another thing, the employees want, want something else, um, all those costs that are associated with that. And we believe that investing in a model where everybody's interests are profitably, properly aligned, including ours as an investor and our, our investors as investees, as well as the executives as well as the workforce, helps eliminate a lot of those, those, those misalignment costs. Um, all that to say, we, we invest using a, a mezzanine instrument because it's our goal on day one to have 100% of the firm um, owned by the workers in the trust. Um, I, we think that's important just from you know, telling the story of, of employee ownership and what it's about, from actually letting the workers know you are you know, real owners of this company, but also going back to some of those tax benefits. Those tax benefits are connected to the percentage of the company that is owned by the workers. So it's important for us that 100% of the equity is in the hands of the, the workers, because then 100% of that tax benefit applies. If 50% of, of it was in the hands of the workers, then 50% of the benefit uh, applies. So again, we see an alignment between the interest of, of investment and the interest of the workers and, and making this 100% employee owned. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how we get the, the investor investor debt into the company at what we we know and believe is a properly kind of risk adjusted return, where you get that that debt like piece and that equity like piece. Um, qu quickly to the, I actually had typed a long answer out to the to the role of philanthropic grant funding. So I won't say it, but I'll, I'll um, I had answered it privately to somebody. I'll drop it in the chat and I'll let I'll let Allison jump in. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So um, uh, from, from Project Equity's perspective, so the Employee Ownership Catalyst Fund, um, we really structured so it's an evergreen debt fund, and we structured it really to bridge the, the real capital barriers <clears throat> to employee ownership that we've seen in our work over the last 10 years. Um, so, you know, imagine you're a business owner and you're trying to, you're trying to sell your company this way, and you're like, oh, great, I'm going to, you know, just do, do a, an ESOP or a co-op or an EOT, and I'm gonna just walk down to my bank and like get them to finance this thing. Well, the bank's gonna look at you like you got three heads because you know they're not used to dealing with um, 50 owners. <laughs> um, they're like, well, who's gonna sign the personal guarantee? Like, whose house is gonna be on the line? Like, if and that's it's just a, it's just a different model and approach. We want to get to the place where you can't walk into your bank and your bank knows what this is and that the SBA loans, somebody uh, noted a question about SBA loans, that the SBA loan guarantee programs um, can support all of the models of broad-based employee ownership. We're not there yet. We're working on it. Um, we're not there yet. So, um, so the Catalyst Fund is um, by design structured to be flexible. So we can put out capital that is debt. We can put out capital that is equity. We can do um, revenue or profit-based financing. Um, so really maximum flexibility. We can provide working capital alongside the transaction. We can do working capital actually before the transaction to help, to help with the costs of, of getting this set up you know, for companies coming out of COVID. Cash flow is always king, but it's like really super king um, now. Um, so, so, so you know, flexibility is is the name of the game, and you know, ultimately, we are um, we have structured the fund to with an aim to maximize the money that stays in the employee owner's you know hands. So, because at the end of the day, that's why we're in this work. Um, so, this is impact first capital. It's long term patient financing. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing that I will, will sort of comment on is, you know, different capital fills different needs. So, you know, Catalyst Fund, Impact First, filling this gap in the capital market. Um, but, you know, one of the most exciting things that I've seen in the impact space and employee ownership in the last year or so was, was a quote, actually, that was, was came, out of, came from a pension fund that invested in a, a, a San Diego company that, that transitioned, they're called Taylor Guitars. Um, and the, the pension fund was quoted as saying something like, um, we chose to invest in this employee ownership transition because it is low risk. And I saw that in writing somewhere and I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is perceived risk of employee ownership because it is unfamiliar, um, and you know 
we'll, we'll send you the tome of the case for employee ownership that has all the data points in it, you know, all the studies, right? Um, but the reality is, is that, that, you know, what Todd has been talking about and what, you know, the slides that I shared, like that increased employee engagement, you know, when done right, the magic happens when you got the structure and the ownership culture. So when you've got those two components really working together, um, this is something that is low risk. Um, so, you know, demonstrating really to investors that this, that employee ownership is an investable impact when that truly delivers impact, you know, not just today, right? It's not a one-time impact. We're creating this employee-owned company that's gonna deliver impact into the future and over the long-term. Um, so, yeah. Thanks for that. I, I think I'll just add from the West perspective, um, there's also a variety of different ways you can invest in these types of funds. So Allison mentioned she structured her fund as an evergreen debt fund, which has three tranches. There's the senior note, the junior note, and a grant um, grant uh, tranche as well. And then for Todd, it, it's more of a, a, a traditional closed fund, uh, LPGP type structure, which looks like a private equity fund. And so there's different types of investments and also types of capital we can deploy as a um, flexible impact investor, program-related investments, mission-related investments, depending on um, on the risk appetite and the strategy. And so just to say, as we look at how do we crowd in more investors and different types of investors, there's, as Todd thinks about fund two, three, I mean, he's already starting to talk about how do we get more um, RIA capital and just more kind of traditional sources of capital to scale. Um, because the numbers we're talking about um, you know, are still relatively small in regards to the funds that you both have, but in regards to the opportunity. And so just as we think about, you know, what's the role of maybe catalytic capital to demonstrate the, the model work with first time fund managers that then can take their track record and run with it. Um, that's certainly something we're thinking a lot about at West, um, both in regards to the types of structures we want to demonstrate in the market. So I think, Allison, the way that you're being really flexible with your model, Todd, with the unique approach you have to ESOPs, blending it with the ethos of a co-op, if you will, you know, there's ways that I think we're looking to learn via you um, to see what works and what could be scaled, um, but also thinking critically about where um, and what type of investment capital makes sense. Um, I'll just mention that grants are definitely part of the equation to increase ca capacity um, as we look at some of the teams that we're working with. Perhaps there's um, grants that we can do for fellows and we're exploring this with a couple partners to think about adding extra capacity on, on teams so that we can support um, more proximate leaders to join teams, build that track record alongside these incredible fund managers, and then maybe spin off future funds. So we're, we're thinking about different strategies and trying to be creative about ways to blend the types of capital that we have at WES um, to try to solve the, the problems that we see with kind of the fund managers from a capacity constraints to, to of course, the market and where we see the need for demonstration. So um, I'll, I'll just kind of add that from, from the high level of the way investors can engage in these types um, of funds. But I don't know, if Thaddeus, you have anything to add there. Otherwise, I'm happy to start taking some questions in the chat. I'm seeing some good activity. The only thing I would add is um, we, we yeah. saw a, a, a very big need in the market for people to take first more risks. And so we, as our, we've had our, our investment thesis evolve and where we see our fit in the market, um, being willing to say, we're, we're willing to take the first move risk in you. Um, we'll also put you through an institutional diligence process as, as well. We're not like, a, unlike like some foundations can offer grant capital that, that can be forgiven. We have investors in our funds that expect to get the money back. So we have to, we, we can't we, have, we can't callously put our investor capital at risk. So that, that kind of forces us to have a very institutional lens of how we approach diligence. Um, but usually, our biggest wins are when we, we come in with a, a, a decent size commitment relative to our fund hold limits, and then that's able to galvanize other capital partners, even with bigger pockets, to, to deals or trades that we're in. And we do we love doing that and love sitting on deals as calls with with uh, potential uh, investors, uh, co-investors that that are going to follow us into into deals. And 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 like I said, they were really happy about the the uh, ownership model and then looking to do more of that out of our out of our third fund once it's online. So.
Great. Um, anything else, Todd and Allison, before we pass to audience for questions? Um, yeah, I'll jump in with, with yeah. just one other kind of um, just to share with, with the audience about like the there are different approaches to creating employee ownership and, and the breadth of really investment opportunities can align with those. So, you know, I talked a little bit about this idea of an independent transition, um, which is one approach. Um, the company become employee, it becomes employee owned, remains independently owned throughout, kind of the investor isn't acquiring the business at any stage. Um, and there are other approaches that start with acquiring the business in order to get that transaction done quickly and then pretty immediately transition or at that time transition to it to employee ownership. Um, and there are, there are yet other approaches that acquire the company kind of more like a, a, a private equity firm might acquire it and hold it, you know, perhaps to, you know, tune it up operationally or tune it up, say, environmentally, um, and then after some period of time, exit, uh, exit the fund to employee ownership. So, so that's another just sort of way that employee ownership approaches can differ. And you know, the great news is they all end up with an employee owned company um, and they can have different, the, the capital relationship and the investor relationship can be different in those different scenarios. I'll, uh, I'll add on, on top of that before, before we get to the Q and A and I, I'm, I'm not going to take more than 60 seconds because I have so much to say. So it's going to be really, really brief, but kind of kind of like four things I, as, a, as a field, and not just a field as a country utilizing employment, we have to do. One, we have to, and I, and I think uh, organizations like Apex and Heritage and, and Project Equity and, and the investors are doing this, is we have to bring down the cost of capital for this transaction. And the way you bring down the cost of capital um, and if somebody has a detailed question, we can talk about that a little bit more, is, is by de-risking the model, is by taking all the perceived risk, which is much higher than the actual risk. So if you look at the default rate on, again, just using ESOPs, because there's a lot of data out there, the default rate on ESOP loans is significantly lower, um, is less than 1%, significantly lower than even what, like the SBA kind of uh, uh, requirements are. But uh, again, there's not a lot of SBA funding for these loans. A lot of traditional organizations and, finance and banks don't, don't finance these loans. So we have to de-risk it, then we have to make it uh, uh, more accessible and start to see, you know, our goal is that one day you won't need a, uh, impact funds to do these conversions. Your, your local bank or your local CDFI will be able to finance, you know, most if not all of these sorts of loans. So we have to bring down the cost of capital. I used up most of my time on that, so let me quick. We have to, you have to invest in TA and technical assistance. So we partner up with the Democracy at Work Institute, which is a national nonprofit that, that uh, incubated APIS and Heritage Capital Partners and incubated the fund. So really interesting story about how philanthropic dollars and nonprofits can help create organizations that are that are investing in the, in the traditional impact markets and traditional markets. Um, but you have to invest in the technical assistance of the workforce and helping workers to transition their thinking to workers, to worker owners, helping them build that, that confidence and that skill set to understand what's going on in the company the way an owner would to get a lot of the benefits that, that employee ownership brings to, to companies. If, you, if it's just a cool retirement account that you get a statement for and you get, you get paid out when you retire, that's great, you know, that's a positive, but to really get the business benefits, you have to do the training and the technical assistance. And that's why Dow is, is uh, our partner. Um, you have to, if, if you don't focus on racial equity and workforces of color, it's not just gonna happen. If, if it's not a part of your investment thesis and your investment criteria, then and you say you're gonna you're gonna help deal with the racial wealth gap, it's not gonna happen if it's if it's not built into the model. And then finally, a Smith a, a reference, which is a, a fellowship program we're we're working on with Wes. We're at the very beginning of this of this asset class, as, as Allison alluded to. Now is the time to get your diverse uh, your diverse. Uh, players in all senses, your diverse finance professionals, your diverse board members, your diverse CEOs that you may need to bring in, get those folks in now at the ground floor. So as this continues to emerge and grow, it, the field will be diverse from, from the very beginning. We won't have to kind of try to catch up on the back end. Um, that was more than a minute. Sorry about that. I'll stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. So I'll, I'll answer a couple uh, real quick. So I'll include in the chat to the question about how you can learn more about West funds and apply to these funds. We, we try to be as transparent as possible about our impact investing priorities, um, grant making priorities on our website, and also have an open call for ideas. So that's a great way to get in touch, but I'm also on LinkedIn and you can reach me there. Um, slides being available. I saw a couple questions about that. Um, Allison, I'll say yes. <laughs> we, we're happy to 
to share, but they also have Project Equity and APIS and Heritage have great resources on their website. Um, Project Equity has a case on um, employee ownership that they launched last year. So we can maybe include that PDF as well, which goes a little bit deeper. Um, so there's a there's a question here about um, from Scott Moon in the chat about any thoughts on how to incentivize or drive additional founders to consider the ESOP model. Um, I'm curious, Todd, you're kind of in this right now, looking to get a couple deals out the door as within your first fund and, and more to come. So maybe I'll pass to you to, to answer that one. Uh, Samantha, can you repeat it for me one more time? I was responding. Yeah, so, was so his question was about, you know, basically founders seem interested in the succession. Um, they're driven by legacy objectives, financial liquidity, but um, any other thoughts on how to incentivize or drive additional founders to the ESOP model? No, that, that, that's right. So I'll tell you kind of kind of our take is, is there, there are a number of frictions to transitioning your business to, to employee ownership that don't exist in other forms of, of transition. Um, I won't go into all of them, but kind of one of our big thing, one of our big things is our goal is to make selling to your workers as easy as it is to sell to some private equity firm or to a strategic buyer or to a competitor, all of who we see many owners saying, man, I don't want to do this, but I don't, you know, there's nobody in my family to, to pass it off to take this business over. So it seems like I'm stuck between all these rocks and hard places because I, I know what's going to happen if I sell to my, my competitor or to this PE firm or to a strategic. And, and they know what's going to happen to their legacy and oftentimes what's going to happen to their workforce. So, so really addressing the, the frictions, how can we make it as fast and as easy to sell to owners as it is to these other options is what we're dealing with. Part of that is liquidity. So in the ESOP world, ESOPs are traditionally heavily financed by a, by a seller's note. The owner is financing a lot of the, the, the acquisition capital and every owner can't do that. And every owner is not willing to do that, especially when you look at you know, black and brown communities where you may have had a successful business. That doesn't mean you still have a ton of wealth. All of your wealth may still be tied up in the business. So the idea that you're going to, you know, you're going to put a loan for five or seven years and, and not get your, it's not, it's not possible. So our fund is we're bringing liquidity to owners um, like they would get in a, in a PE transaction or strategic transaction. So that's, that's one of many, um, some of the costs in figuring out um, how to do the transition. I know that goes into our due diligence that goes into, I'm sure project equity as part of your process of figuring out if there's an investment opportunity. So we take that off of the, the owner's plate. So, you know, figure, you know, knowing where all of those are and addressing those with the investment and how you're investing is how you can get owners to really um, open their eyes. Even once they, they figure out they like it, we can say, hey, you can like it and we can help you do it. Really well said. I'd love, love exactly that. Absolutely co-sign and everything you just said. And I'll just add one other thing, which is um, awareness. Like the first piece is nobody knows about employee ownership. <laughs> and if they do, they, they may like not really understand it or have misconceptions. Um, and so we spend a lot of time on awareness and we actually have a, a, um, a, a brand campaign for employee ownership that we launched last October with some peers in the field. It's called employee, it's called EO equals, employeeownershipequals.org is the website, really to focus on those business owners who, who aren't already Googling employee ownership, right? We wanna get more people who have heard about it and have positive association with it um, because that's gonna open up the top of the funnel much bigger as well. Um, I, so I think we answered the question on SBA loan. So I might skip to, um, to a question more about the history. So is there a history of having employee ownership, corporate structure combinations that can work long-term? For example, a company set up with employee ownership for a primary business, which then holds subsidiaries or partner firms with traditional corporate structures. Um, so curious if, if you could share some of that background. I mean, I can talk about um, what we see in other countries. Um, you yeah. know, uh, certainly there are small examples of this in the United States of acquisitions happening, and there is is more of, of sort of an interest and an effort to support employee-owned companies to do acquisitions. That is that is happening right now. Um, but in other countries, we absolutely see this, and you know, the, the sort of uh, best known example is in the Basque region of Spain. Uh, it's called Mondragon, which is um, essentially a, um, you know, a, a, a corporate entity that is made up of all employee-owned companies. And they started with one manufacturing business. And now I can't remember off the top of my head, but, you know, tens of billions of, 
of dollars in in euros in, in revenue um, a year across you know 200 plus um, businesses that all exist um, sort of within this employee owned structure. Um, so absolutely, there's that that is is a is a model that happens um, and and is one that we'd love to see more of in the United States as well. I'll, I'll add to that. There's a lot of innovative things being done with with uh, employee ownership and and traditional structures. Um, I can say is that employee owned businesses, ESOPs, are are have been shown to be really powerful. Also, uh, uh, M and A and acquisition tools. So the ability for for these firms to to acquire other firms, partly because of some of the amazing benefits that can be given to the owner of the selling company. Um, um, that are out there that make their offers really attractive. This mix between between employee owned and not employee owned subsidiaries. Um, there are very very well paid lawyers out there who I'm sure um, if they haven't already figured it out, they will figure it out if if you ask them. Um, we, we know we know a lot of those lawyers and those attorneys who do really good work around the space. So so um, we're happy to, to to connect folks up, folks who who could get really really innovative with structures to, to achieve the the, the goals. And before before we wrap, I'll I'll ask one more question from the chat, which is around: um, Could you speak to earlier stage or organizations? Um, speak to seed capital channels available for for profit organizations that are looking to build and accelerate employee ownership. So so yeah, if the question if the question is about startups, um, I might refer folks to startup.coop as a wonderful um, wonderful resource. Uh, I know that they they do a lot of really um, amazing you know, technical support and community building, uh, and I believe they also have a fund um, you know designed to support yeah. startups. Um, you know, if it's really more about companies that are established and are, are trying to dip their toe in the water and, and learn more about what this could look like, maybe get started with a small portion of employee ownership. Um, you know, there are, similarly, there are, are wonderful funds, you know, including the Employee Ownership Catalyst Fund that are designed to, you know, to help with that CDFIs, um, a number of CDFIs that are, are, have um, loan funds to support employee ownership. There's there's a couple of funds in the space in addition to start.coop like the ICA group and looking at um, uh, Good Scout Capital that are looking at earlier stage organizations that might be interesting to look at there. Um, but I know we're basically at time so I'll, I'll pause the questions there so sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, but just to quickly wrap that thank you so much for all of your time and engagement in the chat during the session. I um, look forward to continuing this conversation in the SOCAP community and, um, and using Todd's language, developing employee ownership as a robust asset class. I think we're well on our way, um, but certainly need more co-conspirators. So hopefully this um, session just inspired you to join us, connect with us, and, uh, and work with us to expand opportunities for, for employee ownership. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.